Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the webinar. We are going to give folks just a minute or two uh, to, to file in virtually, and then we will get started. For folks who are just joining, thank you so much. We're just going to give folks another minute and then we'll we'll get started in just a minute. All right, we're a couple minutes after and um, we are going to jump in. Thank you all so much for joining our webinar today focused on building political power to win against healthcare pricing abuses, insights from California's approach to tackle unaffordable prices. We're really looking forward and excited for the conversation today uh, to talk about uh, our nation's healthcare affordability crisis and how uh, advocates, particularly partners and stakeholders in California have been organizing uh, to tackle the issue in California. Specifically, we'll be talking about California's new Office of Healthcare Affordability. Before we get uh, started, um, I uh, want to just make a quick note for folks. If you're having any technical issues during the webinar, um, please uh, feel free to add a message in the chat box to my colleague, Mike Persley. He's on hand and he's uh, able to help any folks who might have any issues as they're coming up. We're going to have uh, a little bit of a, a presentation uh, initially, and then really we're going to spend the bulk of the webinar having a panel discussion with some esteemed guests. Um, and there'll be lots of opportunity for Q&A. So please, throughout the webinar, if you have questions, drop them in the Q&A box. Um, when we get into the panel discussion, we'll be pulling them in. And then, of course, we'll make sure we have designated time at the end for folks to ask questions through the chat function. All right, if we can go to the next slide. Uh, my name is Sophia Tripoli. I am the Senior Director of Health Policy here at Families USA. Um, for folks who don't know, Families USA is a leading national voice for healthcare consumers dedicated to the achievement of high quality, affordable healthcare and improved health for all. If we can go to the next slide. Um, I just wanna take a quick minute to introduce our guests. Um, we also have, in addition to myself from Families, we have uh, Alicia Kamaliche, who's a policy analyst who is spending a good chunk of her time working on provider pricing, uh, particularly uh, working on the Office of Healthcare Affordability work in California. We're also joined by Anthony Wright, who's the Executive Director of Health Access California, uh, Bill Kramer, who's the Senior Advisor of Health Policy at Purchaser Business Group on Health, and Matt Leger, who is the Government Relations Associate at uh, SEIU California. Um, we're really excited for the conversation. If we can move to the next slide, um, I'm going to turn it over to Alicia, who's going to provide a little bit of an um, overview of the national healthcare affordability crisis, uh, as well as some background in the California Office of Healthcare Affordability. So we're all kind of speaking from the same playbook, uh, and then we'll move into the panel discussion. Alicia, I'm going to kick it to you. Thank you so much, Sophia. So hi, everybody. My name is Alicia. Um, as Sophia said, I'm a policy analyst with Families USA, working on our hospital pricing, payment reform, and health equity work. I'm so excited to be here with you all today and be able to engage in this conversation. Uh, as uh, If you want to shout out in the chat where what state you're listening from, we'd love that. Um, we're just excited that you're all here. So um, I'm going to, before we move into our panel, I'm going to provide some background on the national hospital pricing landscape and the policy work being done across the country. 
as well as some background on what's happening in California specifically, just to shape up our conversation that we're going to have later today with our amazing panelists. So I'm just going to jump right into it. I'm sure the reason that most of you are on this webinar today is because you're gravely aware of the healthcare affordability crisis facing families across the U.S. Across the country, families are struggling to afford the health care they need and are then being saddled by mountains of debt they can sometimes never pay off. Um, up to 40% of U.S. adults report skipping medical tests or treatments due to cost, which can often result in conditions worsening. And research shows up to 100 million people in the U.S. have some form of medical debt. And the worst part is, for all of that money spent, quality continues to stagnate and lag behind comparable nations. So we really can't keep going the way we're headed. Healthcare costs have been drastically increasing over the past few decades, and now healthcare makes up 17% of the U.S. economy. And by 2030, it's estimated that one out of every five dollars spent on spent will be on healthcare. Hospital prices are driving increases in healthcare spending, representing the largest share in national healthcare spending, while also accounting for one quarter of all waste generated by the U.S. health system. That is terrifying. And behind decades of cost growth and the very alarming statistics I just ran us through um, are these perverse incentives driving major healthcare corporations to dominate our healthcare markets, raise prices, and increase volume with little accountability to the quality of care being provided. It has been well established that these high and increasing healthcare prices and hospital prices in particular are the result of decades of significant consolidation across the U.S. and with, within U.S. healthcare markets. The result is that we have few truly competitive healthcare markets left, leading to unchecked price growth. So we're going to move on to the next slide. Um, after all of that doom and gloom, I'm very happy to announce we have real policy solutions that are in, that are underway, um, and that we can take to kind of help resolve this problem, and provide real relief to consumers. These policy solutions range from strengthening price transparency to truly reforming the financial incentives driving healthcare cost growth through a movement towards advanced alternative payment models um, and other important policies. Policies such as these really help work to reorient the incentives driving our current healthcare system and move us towards a system that truly works for our patients, which is the ultimate goal. So I can't go through all of these uh, policies on the slide today, but here are just a few examples of some promising healthcare pricing solutions that we uplift here at Families USA. I would also be remiss not to shout out the Lower Cost More Transparency Act, which passed the House this past Monday. Um, the legislation strengthens federal price transparency by making it clear without exception that hospitals must post prices in machine-readable consumer-friendly formats and act site neutral payments for drug administration services so that consumers pay the same price for the same service no matter where they get it and advances billing transparency reforms. Uh, so big deal and big win. I, I feel like we have to highlight the wins after I go through pretty much the most devastating statistics. Uh, and we're going to keep this happy energy moving on to the next slide, where we're going to talk about some other important state uh, state wins and um, state movements. So on the state level, so much work has been done to transform the healthcare pricing landscape. 22 states now have all payers claims databases. 16 states have granted their AGs or another agency the authority to review healthcare mergers, Eight states have prescription drug affordability boards. Three states now have penalties for non-compliance of price transparency. And if I'm correct, I think another three states have codified price transparency in their statute. Um, and eight states, soon to be 10, have established healthcare spending growth targets. Soon to be joining the list of states with spending targets is California, who is in the process of implementing some of the most comprehensive healthcare spending target legislation to date, which will be the focus of today's webinar. So let's talk a little bit about California. Uh, next slide. So like the rest of the country, California residents were and are really grappling with the impacts of high healthcare costs. 52% of Californians report skipping care due to cost and 36 report having medical debt. Those numbers are even higher for black and Latino populations who are some of the most impacted by unaffordable healthcare costs and burdened by the effects of medical debt, which can be truly devastating socially, financially, and physically. Personal healthcare spending in California grew on average 4.7 per year between 2010 and 2020, which was nearly three times the rate of inflation, with rising hospital prices being a major driving driver of those that increase in spending. Consumers have felt this increase in spending in many forms, including higher out-of-pocket costs, as well as reductions in wage growth and benefits as employees struggle to keep up with 
uh, rising premiums. So Californians, like the rest of the country, have really been hit hard by growing healthcare prices. Luckily, California has amazing advocates and some pretty good legislators that went to work to, kind of, to resolve this problem. And we can move on to the next slide. So in 2022, California advocates, including our three incredible panelists here today, worked with lawmakers to pass SB 184, which established the Office of Healthcare Affordability, which you may hear be referred to as OCA, uh, along, which alongside the Healthcare Affordability Board will be tasked with slowing spending growth, promoting value, and understanding market consolidation. And that is a real summary. <laughs> There's a lot of parts to it. So to accomplish these things, the office has a few key requirements. The office must collect and report data on total healthcare expenditures. That data will inform the state, uh, the statewide and sector-specific spending targets, which the office has the authority to enforce through financial penalties meaning these targets have some real teeth. Uh, the office will also track metrics on quality, equity, and access, and set benchmarks for alternative payment model adoption and investments in primary care and behavioral health to promote value-based care and long-term improvement of our healthcare system. The office will also assess healthcare entity transactions and conduct cost and market impact reviews that can be used to inform decisions around major transactions and legislative solutions to the problem of consolidation, a really key part of this legislation. So that was a really quick overview, and I'm sure that was a lot to absorb. So if you have any questions that you would like to ask our expert panel or even us here at Families USA, feel free to drop them in the chat in the Q&A function. We'll get to as many as we can, and if we can't, we'll try to get to you via email. And we're going to move to the next slide and talk about implementation before we move into our panel. So this legislation is a really great starting point, um, but implementation can really make or break things like this. And over the next year, there will be a lot happening with OCA. So OCA will be establishing the state spending target methodology and publishing spending data, proposing and then setting the state 2025 statewide spending targets, which will not be enforceable, um, and also create APM adoption standards and benchmarks and so much more, as you can see on our timeline. There's a lot yet to come and implementation will be over the course of several more years. Um, so this is just a really zoomed in scope of what the office will be doing. But I really wanted to take this moment to really emphasize the scope and the potential impact of this legislation, which goes far beyond spending targets alone. This is certainly not the end all be all for solving hospital prices, but it really is a huge accomplishment for our California advocates. Driving this legislation was a coalition of advocates representing a variety of different stakeholders, including consumers, employers, workers, payers. And I feel like I must be missing somebody because there were just so many important people in this work. Um, and the OCA really represents the power of advocacy and coalition building, which is why I'm so thrilled to be able to highlight the policy here for you today. So I'm gonna stop talking and move, we'll, we're gonna move into our panel portion and let our speakers provide a little bit more insight into the unlikely partnerships that got this legislation passed and the policy considerations driving it. I'll pass it back to you, Sophia, and we can bring down the slides, Kevin. Thank you so much, Alicia. Okay, so now opening up to our uh, esteemed panelists, I think the first thing is just reactions from you guys. Um, obviously the affordability, the healthcare affordability crisis is pretty well established. The role of high prices, particularly hospital prices resulting from a lot of uh, unchecked consolidation over the last several decades being a driving, a major driving force. But I want to just open it up and hear from each of you why, from your different perspectives, is the affordability crisis so important to your organizations um, and the stakeholders that you guys represent? And Anthony, you're off mute, so I feel like you're the guinea pig to go first. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you so much to Families USA for hosting this. Uh, my name is Anthony Wright. I'm the Executive Director of Health Access California, the statewide healthcare consumer advocacy coalition, working for the goal of quality for the healthcare for all Californians. And while we've been doing a lot of great work in California on expanding health coverage, um, we also recognize that that this doesn't work if it's not affordable and affordable for the system and for, um, as a part of our a, a economy but also affordable to consumers on the ground level in terms of the premiums they pay, the cost sharing they pay, et cetera. And, you know, just to add to Alicia's overview, I just want to be clear that, you know, it, it's not just that, uh, that healthcare prices are high, but that they're inflated, that there is a market failure in healthcare um, for, for a variety of reasons. I mean, uh, healthcare is unique and as it's one of the, um, the things that we purchase that we can't really say no to, but um, as, uh, was shown on the map, 
we have huge disparities in terms of what things charge. Um, and that tends to be more related to not, not what we get charged has little to do with the relationship of quality or outcomes or equity, and more just what is the market power of the given players in a given region. And so that's why we have such huge disparities, even within the control set of California, that it, it it tends not to be our state laws or regulations or our, our, our labor markets or other things. It, those variations come from issues of whether it's market concentration or other issues. And so in order to, and how do you deal with the with that issue? We, um, over several years, have been working with um, our partners, um, whether, it, you know, consumer groups, community groups, labor groups, purchaser group, other purchaser groups, to um, deal with various market failures, whether it's on surprise medical bills or other issues. But even when we find those solutions, and certainly there have been things done both at the policy level and at the practice levels to bring down the cost of healthcare, but in our sort of fragmented healthcare system and in our consolidated healthcare system, that savings doesn't actually yield a benefit to, to actual patients and payers on the ground, um, that there's too many middle members that you know, rake off the savings, that those that there is not sort of that downward pressure um, to, to make sure that those rates go down. And that's why you need something like an Office of Healthcare Affordability. That doesn't mean, you need to do those other things as well, those innovations within the, the system to transform how we deliver care. You need to do those policy changes to deal with bad actors and abuses in the system. But you also need an overarching look at the healthcare system to and and the ability to, to, to make sure that those savings that um, uh, yield to patients and payers. Um, we're never going to meet a goal we never set, and then and then this provides a framework for those uh, for those other things to be effective with regard to cost savings. Thank you so much, Anthony. And uh, there's a lot in there to unpack, and we're going to unpack it as we go through the conversation. But I want to give a chance for Bill and Matt to offer their perspectives. Bill's off mute, so I'm I'm going to you next, Bill. Thanks very much, Sophia, and thanks again to Families USA for hosting this. Uh, and spreading the word about this important uh, accomplishment in California. We've made some really important steps, but of course there's a lot more still to do. Um, I agree with the uh, things that Anthony said. Um, he and his team at Health Access, as well as um, at SEIU and others have been great partners in this effort. Uh, as Sophia said, I'm Bill Kramer. I'm the Senior Advisor for Health Policy, the Purchaser Business Group on Health. We're a not-for-profit organization. Our membership is consists of large employers, uh, most with a national or multi-state presence, as well as public sector purchasers like CalPERS and uh, State of Washington Healthcare Authority. Um, we were in this um, effort because uh, of the affordability crisis and the way it affects our members, uh, employers in general, uh, especially small employers, and uh, the employees and their families. Uh, this is... Um, been going on for years. We've been fighting as, as much as we can, both uh, working directly with health plans, directly with um, uh, physicians and hospital groups uh, to improve affordability, but things keep getting worse. And as a result, it's crowding out um, business investment. Uh, it's crowding out wages. The more money in, of compensation has to go to health benefits. There's less available to give in wages. And it's crowding out jobs. Uh, so this is, it's not just a healthcare affordability crisis. This is a wage and job crisis as well. Uh, the, the ripple effects through the economy are, are enormous. So uh, we're doing everything we can, both as purchasers, uh, but also in the policy arena to try to, um, to bring uh, the forces to bear that will hold down uh, healthcare costs. I think there's, this is a remarkable accomplishment. It builds on the efforts of other states, um, particularly what we've learned from Massachusetts, Oregon, and several others. Um, I think this is a, the most ambitious legislation of its type to date. But again, there are a lot of challenges ahead as we implement this. Happy to talk more about that later in the session. Thank you so much, Bill. And I think, uh, such an important point there about like this really is it's an affordability crisis, but this downward pressure it's having on our our overall economy and how it's working. Um, so and that's the perfect segue, Matt, to just give us your perspective um, from SEIU California. Like, what is 
you know, what's the stake in the game for you guys here? Yeah, and just, uh, you know, I'll just reiterate, thank you so much for having uh, us on. My name is Matt Leger. I'm a government relations advocate or lobbyist with uh, the California State Council. And so we're the statewide association of SCIU locals, and we're the largest union in California. So we represent about 700,000 workers across the spectrum, including in healthcare, but also in the public sector, um, private sector, um, long-term care sector. So, you know, really across the spectrum, many of these are low-wage workers, um, and so when they are able to get health care or when they're fighting for health care for the first time in their contract, that's one of the big points of contention because of how costly it is. Um, and for our public sector workers, but other workers uh, across the spectrum, you know, for us, it's really been one of the key issues for the last 25 years at the bargaining table. And, you know, to Bill's point, you know, we, we get into significant fights with our employers because of health care costs just spiraling out of control and um, really appreciate all the collaboration we're able to do together with employer partners when we can say, well, how do we address costs together? And I think OCA is one of those important, you know, steps and that, you know, is sort of key to our efforts over the line that we can get into um, shortly. But, you know, for us, um, you know, we sort of have this duality of the stake in the game where we both are, you know, fighting for healthcare costs at the bargaining table and making sure that, you know, wages continue to go up. And one point on that, um, just to you know, make sure we put it out there is you know over the last you know 15 years or so, um, average weight uh, the the cost of a premium increase has gone up by about 50 percent from 2008 to 2018 in California. Medium wages has remained flat, so that's really workers falling further and further behind. And you know, housing costs are still high. Everything else is going more expensive and creating an affordability crisis. Where from SCIU, we're losing members. Who are moving out of state. And so, you know, that's sort of fundamental to what we're trying to do. Um, importantly, though, throughout our advocacy around the Office of Healthcare Affordability, and um, I, I actually used to be a healthcare worker, and then I worked for a union that exclusively represented healthcare workers, and now I have the privilege of representing all 700,000 workers in various industries. But making sure that the Office of Healthcare Affordability, as it was implemented, took into account the interest of healthcare workers and how they're going to play a critical role in delivering on some of the savings in the system and addressing costs, while also ensuring that the targets and other things that we're looking at in this are not done off the backs of healthcare workers, particularly those without licenses or those without college degrees, those that, you know, are, you know, cleaning the room, making sure that, you know, the healthcare industry is working um, efficiently and effectively but also making sure that we can, you know, start to, you know, invest in this workforce and figure out how we're going to make sure that we're delivering on these quality um, equity goals that are also critically important to making sure that OCA works. Uh, it's such an important point, Matt, and thank you. And I love the perspective you're bringing about like making sure, like tying this right into the workforce and what this means to make sure that we have a workforce uh, in California and also nationally that's really at the center of making sure we're delivering the high quality affordable care that uh, all of the families and people in our country deserve. I think, um, th let's get into some of the meat because I think you were kind of around the edges. Take us through a little bit. So obviously the legislation that established OCA is what um, a lot of people are talking about as some of the most comprehensive state cost containment policy that we've seen to date. And there are a lot of different pieces of it from the transparency side, it's, it's driving, you know, paying for higher value care, there's investments in primary care, holding the system accountable for costs and quality. Can you guys just walk us through a little bit um, how how this is all supposed to be working? Like what, what and what this, and I think in particular, what this means for people. Uh, and I think Matt, you started to get into a little bit too about like what this looks like for workers um, and particularly healthcare workers, but the tying back to the the consumer and how how is the the patient that individual experiencing and interacting with the healthcare system going to um, feel the effects of of the the office as it gets implemented, knowing that we've got a lot of years of implementation. I don't know who wants to take that one first. Anthony, you want to take a stab? Sure. The the. So I I think this, you know, we looked at what was going on in other states. I mean, part of the genesis of this was, again, this, the, the, this health cost issue. You know, I think we are talking about affordability in a range of areas um, these days. But frankly, affordability in healthcare has been a crisis point for, frankly, a couple of decades. 
And, um, you know, if healthcare, uh, if other things that people complain about now, gas prices, milk prices, uh, went up at, at the rate of uh, healthcare, we'd be talking about, you know, $20, $30 gallons of, of milk or gas, um, it, you know, in terms of just a trajectory. So how are we going to, so how do we address this? And, uh, you know, some of us came together on, on seeking what are, what are solutions to this, whether it be rate regulation or other forms. But we were glad that there was a willingness by some parts of the industry to have the conversation of, okay, if that's not the solution they prefer, what would be a solution that maybe provided more tools and flexibility for the for the, those in the industry, those providers to 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 meet these meet a goal of a cost growth target, uh, but also accountability if they don't, and that's that's where. I think uh, California has taken a step beyond some of the other states that have cost growth target commissions. Um, that we have um, in that we have again tools and flexibility on the front end, but progressive enforcement in the back end. That if if um, a sector uh, does not or in, or a provider does not uh, meet these cost growth targets, there is um, opportunity for performance improvement plans and other progressive enforcement leading up to fines that are commensurate with how much people are being overcharged. And you know that's mu and and that's on a scale much bigger than uh, th that's that is what is in other states. We think that's an important. That's an important signal to the market that we're serious about trying to co uh, contain the the cost of healthcare. It's a. It's a. It's. Um, it's. I think it's done fairly. It's done with flexibility, so that to recognize that if something comes up, um, uh, like a pandemic or a, a really high cost drug, that you know we take those things into consideration. It, it recognizes the diversity of the state. That maybe we might need to, you know, different approaches in our Central Valley versus our Bay Area, and 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 just recognizing that our different regions, um, uh, you know, maybe start at different places, but at the same time that we still have a, a, a accountability throughout the state that we can't just let healthcare costs go up for the sake of going up, you know, to what the market will bear. And that's I, I, uh, that there's a real affordability thing, again, bringing it down to the consumer where, you know, a hospital bill is typically the biggest bill any family will ever get in their life. And it is, uh, it, it, and um, it very it is often life changing. Um, and, and even the sort of the day to day of maintaining, um, you know, maintaining a disease like di asthma or diabetes, just even the regular cost sharing and other costs that are imposed on Californians is a significant strain given all the other costs that my colleagues have talked about. And so, the, so again, at the end of the day, the goal is we, you know, we're not just seeking lower costs for the sake of lower costs. We, you know, this is tied to quality and equity and 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 trying to make sure that we're we're actually getting better value from the healthcare system. And that's why the office has these both metrics and tools to try to move toward a system that invests more in preventive health, a system that prevents more in alternative payment methodologies to try to actually uh, in, innovate and improve the value of care. Um, so we want lower costs, but, but uh, or at least a lower rate of, of cost growth, but it's uh, not at the sacrifice of whether it, quality, equity, and those other key goals. Yeah, and I think that's such an important point because I think a lot of times when we talk about value in the healthcare system, you think lower costs, does that mean um, reduction in services or less access? And I think this is the this is not that. This is about identifying where the prices and the costs are really out of control um, compared to a national or state average and and holding holding the cost below that, um, but not at the expense of making sure that people get the care. In fact, these metrics that you're talking about are really about driving the healthcare system and providers and holding them accountable um, for meeting certain outcome measures, for quality measures, so that patients are actually getting the coordination of services they need, that, they're, uh, that there is a, a, a financial incentive and pressure to actually be reducing inequities in health outcomes. Um, is that, and, and, and I think that's a really important distinction because um, that ultimately is what drives us towards the high value care um, in a very meaningful way. And Bill, I see you're off mute. So Please, please jump in. Well, I'm just building on what uh, you and Anthony were just saying, Sophia. Um, as Anthony points out, the accountability measures are an essential piece of this and a, a unique, relatively unique piece of this legislation. But this um, broader look um, at our healthcare system 
is also a unique element. Uh, in other words, it's not just about affordability. So just an editorial comment. I wish we had called this office something other than the Office of Healthcare Affordability because it's more than that. The Healthcare Affordability Board is more than about just affordability. Um, that's obviously an essential goal, but we have to establish guardrails, and the legislation does this to ensure we don't achieve the affordability goals by sacrificing quality or access or equity. Uh, in fact, the legislation is very explicit about that goal, the, the multiple goals, and the state will be monitoring quality, access, and equity to make sure they are not damaged in the as we make progress toward um, uh, affordability goals. And I think uh, implicit in this is a recognition of, uh, that there are ways to improve care while lowering costs. Um, and so the emphasis on greater investments in primary care, greater investments in behavioral health, uh, moving, moving from fee-for-service toward uh, value-based or population-based payments, all those are uh, elements in our healthcare system, which if we do them right, could result in lower costs, better quality, uh, as, as well as improved access and, and equity in our system. The legislation recognizes that it's going to be a challenge to pull it off, but that's what we're we're going to try to achieve. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, go ahead, Matt. Well, I, and so I mean, I think both uh, you know Anthony and Bill. I mean, this is why we worked in a coalition together, so we're all on the same page uh, on on many of these points. And and I would just say for SEIU in particular, uh, you know, ensuring that there was real accountability was was the critical piece. That, that this was key. You know, this wasn't just a monitoring. We've done a lot of transparency bills in the California over time, but really needed to have this accountability piece. Um, but also, you know, an important piece of that is an accountability piece that is not solely on the backs of healthcare workers, um, you know, particularly these workers that uh, I was once, but that are sort of these service and tech workers. Those are the first workers that our employers are always going to try to hold their wages down or cut their costs um, and off the backs of. And so, you know, while there is an important change that's going to happen because of the uh, incentives that are put in place within the legislation, we wanted to make sure within this that these metrics are not just off the backs of these workers so that, you know, you can still continue to keep it as a good middle class job, that they're designed at the heart of it, because partly, you know, the cheapest form of health care is to deny everyone care. And that's not what we want either. And so we want to make sure that, you know, these investments in the workers to do things correctly, make sure we're reducing patient falls, make sure we're reducing hospitalizations by you know turning patients so they don't have bed sores, right? Things like that are very minor things that actually putting the workforce and empowering them is going to help us deliver on these quality and equity measures and, and uh, goals that we have as the state, um, while at the same time, ensuring that we have a workforce that can actually deliver. Um, so, you know, we really have been pushing hard on that. We'll continue to push hard on that throughout um, the implementation process, um, but it is going to mean that there's going to be changes in the healthcare workforce. So, you know, we should be honest about that too. And we need to deliver care differently. We need to de deliver more care in primary care. And how do we make sure that those are good jobs as well is something that we're always sort of considering, not just in this legislation, but throughout SEIU's advocacy in the legislature as well as it moves forward. Yeah. And I think that's a really important point to lift up that um, you know, at the core of this is really uh, this effort and what we're seeing around not just aff uh, affordability, but quality across the country, including in California, is these underlying incentives in, in the healthcare system that are just driving towards really low value care, really uh, high, unaffordable, high cost, and a lot of times low quality care. And so, and, and obviously the healthcare system responds to the financial and economic incentives that are, that, that we're that we're all living in and working in. So I think what's important to point out too is what you're saying, Matt, is like thinking about we, you know, and that's part of the idea of like this shift towards alternative types of payment approaches and different types of financial incentives under the Office of Healthcare Affordability in Implementation, right? That we're driving different sets of financial incentives and sending that signal to the healthcare sector to providers um, that they actually uh, need to be doing all the things you just said. Those sound like minor things, but that's the difference between um, whether your mom who's in a, a rehab hospital um, trying to get better from a broken fall is getting bed sores and then has to stay longer in the hospital or actually recovers and able to get out. Those, those are actually not minor, minor outcomes at all. That's pretty significant. And then when you talk about that at scale, 
for a population, it's major. And so um, I think just pointing out that for folks that who are listening, uh, it's the, part of the role here is we're trying to drive towards a different set of economics in the state um, that are actually going to be able to drive towards that higher value, higher quality care that we know is going to get keep people healthy um, and get them better when they're getting sick and that type of stuff. So I want to just quickly, I want to um, shift a little bit gears. Obviously, California, you know, you guys are uh, the most recent state to enact sort of a benchmark uh, program approach and cost targets. But of course, there's some others out there, Massachusetts, et cetera. Are there any lessons learned as you guys were engaging in the advocacy around the design um, and working with legislatures in the states? Or are there any lessons learned from the other models across the state that are noteworthy to pull out that really kind of stuck with you and, and you guys are pushing from learning from the experience of other states? I mean, I, I'll, I can start by saying that, you know, I think we learned a lot from Massachusetts. I think Massage, uh, we were actually impressed that um, that there was a real impact by just the act of setting the goal. Um, as I said before, you know, you never never reach a goal you don't set. And just having the goal and having the transparency and the focus um, had an impact in Massachusetts. Um, it, and, and that's the state that has had the longest, uh, you know, track record with this. But even, uh, but we also learned that even they, you know, once start um, after a couple of years of that, um, you know they're starting to, to to see that there's some uh you know issues and um providers that are going above the the target and so now um you know that that commission in Massachusetts is recommending having greater accountability mechanisms uh in place and so so you know we learn from Massachusetts hopefully they can learn from us and uh and the other states are in this um, conversation in, in our in our system of laboratories of democracies at the state level. In um, another, uh, uh, I think it was also helpful for us to set a standard that um, our the governance board um, did not have um, any conflicts of interest of uh, you know f folks on both sides of the negotiating table the, that the, those who are in regulated entities shouldn't be on the board. That there is a role for them in an advisory committee that. Uh, uh, advisory committee that I also sit on, but that the, but that there is a board that um, does not have those conflicts, and I think that's important. And then a third um, goal uh, that I think Massachusetts is also uh, relooking at is that it's one thing to set a target for the system as a whole, which is I think really important. It's important for the sustainability of, of the system, but also to try to track um, metrics at the in terms of how people experience it at the the, at the patient level, at the payer level, that is, uh, you know, in terms of premiums, in terms of cost sharing, because again, there's, a, you know, again, we have a fragmented system enough that you could actually have impacts at the, that broad system level, but it, it, it may not necessarily still be translating when people see their deductibles rise, their premium, their share of premiums rise, and you and and that's where you actually want that people to have the the relief that they so desperately need and have been clamoring for for so long. Thank you so much, Anthony. Bill, go ahead. Yeah, um, building on uh, what Anthony said, I would say there are three unique things that uh, I think we've tried to put in place building on the uh, lessons from other states. One, as we've discussed quite a bit, is accountability. And I would say there's there's a positive element to this too, that providers and health plans that may not initially meet their targets will be given technical assistance uh, as they develop their improvement plans. Uh, so this is not just a, um, uh, a stick, a, a negative reinforcement. If, if they continue to not meet the targets, um, there will be a financial penalty, but that's only after a um, an opportunity to, to demonstrate improvement with support from the state. The other thing we've also talked about earlier was balance. It's not just about affordability. We also have goals of improving quality, access, and equity. And the third uh, element that Anthony started to talk about was this is not just a single statewide target that applies equally to everybody. There is enormous variation in the prices charged from between Northern California and Southern California, between providers in the same area, in the same city um, for specific procedures. So we shouldn't be applying the same targets to everybody. Um, uh, so there is an opportunity in this to, whilst we start with a single statewide target, the board will be setting 
uh, targets for different sectors, for the hospitals, physicians, health plans, for different parts of the state, Southern California, Northern California, the Valley, and uh, potentially for different health systems. So for the Sutter Health System or for Kaiser Permanente or for Dignity, um, there are, um, that's, that's appropriate. And uh, this um, legislation enables us to set targets. It's not a one size fits all. It's targeted, customized uh, as appropriate. I think that's such an important point because I think um, so often when we talk about uh, unaffordable care and pricing, we're talking about just high and rising prices and that's that's definitely happening. But the variability, um, not just across, but within markets and within different players within the markets is so important to have that level, that granularity and understanding how the market is working and the flexibility um, that, that has been uh, envisioned in this legislation and now is being implemented um, is really, really interesting. And I think a lot of folks are very excited to see how that all comes together in the implementation and what it looks like to be setting specific targets um, for different markets and different regions. Um, so I know we'll be very closely, I know you guys will be too, uh, paying attention to that. But I think that's such an important feature to lift out because um, it's it's unique um, and I think very, uh, and, and makes a lot of sense in terms of understanding how markets uh, have to work and that competition looks different in different communities and different uh, localities. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna just take a minute to just uh, we've got a couple questions starting to come in, which is great. So for folks, um, please start dropping some questions in the Q and A. I have a couple more I wanna I wanna tee up, and then we'll start bringing those into the conversation. We started getting the, into this a little bit now in, in the conversation about some of the special features, but obviously you got we're you guys are about a year into implementation here. Uh, you're coming up in a year, I think. Um, and what are some of the major focus points of the work? What like, and in particular, you know, I think it's one thing to get legislation passed and enact it, enacted, and that's a huge feat in itself. It's another thing to get it implemented and to get it implemented well. So I'm curious from you guys, what's the focus? Where are the challenges? Where are the pressures, the pressure points coming up that you that you feel like you can share on a, on a public call? If any. What, maybe I'll start, and it's actually less of a pressure point. I'll maybe I'll let Anthony do it. Maybe, maybe a piece of advice um, for folks as this gets implemented. And I think throughout this coalition, we've always kept a pretty good focus, both on uh, workers from you know SEIU's perspective, but also the purchasers, and then and of course the patients and the cost that's hitting there. So you know one of the things we wanted to make sure to do, even as we really first started, is make sure on that first meeting of our board to really make sure that we have the appropriate turnout and energy, and try to maintain that energy around this is what this means and you know appreciate Bill's point and agree that it's it's the office not just affordability but quality and access and equity um but reminding that board of that's the point of it right and sort of you know it can be a big drop once you know you do that big advocacy push to get over the line and then now you're over the line you got to implement it and you can kind of forget about that outside pressure that needs to be maintained and so maybe that was just one point of call out that you know, it's something that it's hard to maintain that energy, but I do, you know, appreciate the work of um, health access and, and, you know, the broader community to help keep uh, the coalition and others organized around that and keep the pressure on as we work on some of these really technical things, which do start to get very much in the weeds, whether it's the, um, you know, the merger, uh, you know, market review uh, language um, or, you know, some of the other pieces, you know, what 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 are we going to use as those targets for total healthcare expenditure and how are we going to measure this? Um, all of those things can get real wheezy really fast, but it's helpful to remind the board, the public and everyone else, yes, get into the weeds, but don't forget about why we're doing this in the first place. Yeah, it's super important. Thank you, Matt. Bill, go ahead. Yeah, Matt said that very well. I think this collaboration between employers, um, consumers, and labor is really essential. It's essential for getting the legislation passed, and it's essential going forward to ensure successful implementation. Um, um, one of the key things was making sure that uh, there are representatives of consumer groups and purchasers and labor uh, on the board uh, and on the advisory committee. And there were there a lot of tension around <laughs> that process. Um, we also, um, it's, it's important to provide um, technical assistance and support to those representatives because there's a lot of complex issues and, and getting into the weeds. So helping them 
uh, as representatives. For example, we have two of our members on the advisory board, um, but this is not their day job. Um, so I'm, I'm, I review all the materials in advance and provide them with support. They, they need that. Uh, we also need to uh, recognize the kind of debates that are coming and the pushback from the um, some other stakeholders. Uh, and I'll, let me touch on that briefly, uh, and we can talk about more of that if we want. Um, you know, many hospitals, not all, and physician groups and health insurers will push back against this kind of program. Uh, they, there was pushback during the um, debates on the legislation. There's pushback in the on the board and the advisory committee. Uh, this isn't surprising. Uh, they're representing their financial interests. I used to work for a big health system and I used to do this from the other side, but we just need to understand that and make the case that to the board members and policymakers that this legislation is a necessary response to the affordability crisis that we're all facing. Um, we need to make sure that we keep our eye on the ball. This is not just about how do we, you know, all the, the, the challenges that providers face, um, and, and hospitals face things like rising drug costs and uh, other input costs. Yes, that's a challenge, but there, we need to keep our eye on the ball. And Matt mentioned, and labor's been tremendous at this, uh, is reminding folks like we're here about uh, affordability for consumers, purchasers, and patients. Uh, and whatever, whatever you do, make sure you don't lose sight of that. Um, and that's that's really essential. Make, make sure this is all the debates are framed in the right way to keep our eye on the ball, the true north of affordability. Yeah, and I think what you guys are lifting up is probably one of the most important points. And I, you, I know you uh, co-authored a piece that was in Health Affairs a couple months ago that really talked about the coalition. And it's a coalition of unlikely partners that doesn't always agree um, on all issues in healthcare, care um, and sometimes found ourselves in, in, on opposite ends of a, of a policy uh, solution. Um, but on this set of issues, um, there is a lot, there is, there was, and there continues to be so much alignment. And I think it's important to lift up for the folks is uh, how important that that unlikely coalition coming together and the sectors you represent and the power base that you guys were able to form to be that counterweight to a lot of opposition you're getting uh, from a lot of places, but I think probably heavy opposition um, from 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 hospitals, not all hospitals, you said, Bill, but some, right? Um, that really didn't want to see this move forward. And um, so it's, you know, I'm just curious, you know, as we are sort of heading into then here, any reactions to that uh, power building and 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 how you guys are continuing to operate as a coalition in this implementation phase, and how important has that been for the success of the legislation being enacted and the ongoing work to make sure that you have strong implementation? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, it, like with any other organizing challenge, it's one of both depth and breadth. We, um, you know, I think that there, um, uh, healthcare costs are a huge issue, whether, you know, at the bargaining table for workers, whether um, for for um, businesses, employers, and certainly for individuals, but trying to build a coalition that like actually would prioritize it, um, you know, for for Bill's business leaders, it may not be the number one or two issue on their list, um, given the other things they're dealing with. Um, unions have uh, a variety of things on their list. Um, um, same with consumers, but to but everybody recognizing, hey, there is this is a big thing that drives like all these other issues, as my colleagues talked about that. Uh, if if money is going to healthcare that's not going to wages, that you know the impact on affordability broadly, et cetera. So, you know, trying to build sort of a like a deep a coalition that is willing to um, put put emphasis on having um, moving an agenda on healthcare costs, and then frankly, it is making th those alliances, whether it's with the health plans that find that maybe even with their, uh, that they have limit, that they find that they can't negotiate lower prices when the the hospital chain or the, uh, is is just a little bit, you know, it's just bigger and, and they need to, those hospitals in order to be in their network or uh, with regard to some of the other parts of the healthcare system. Again, some of these um, market failure issues. Frankly, even within the provider community, there's some providers that, you know, recognize the cost of healthcare themselves and 
um, would rather be part of a solution or, and frankly, also don't like, don't like the fact that they see other parts of the healthcare system taking advantage of, um, uh, again, market failures, it, it, that makes the whole system look bad. So uh, like the, their willingness to be part of it. And so some of the conversations was about were about bringing those um, interests together or at least lowering the temperature from some of the um, the, the potential opponents. Um, and then I also, you know, need to sort of shout out the, the leadership of people like Assemblymember Jim Wood or Governor Newsom himself, um, both in the in getting this, you know, through the budget process, through the legislative process, and now um, through the um, uh, through the implementation process, and and making sh sure that they continue to have the drumbeat of like why this is so essential uh, again most con you know most voters most consumers healthcare costs continues to pull at like the very top of like what people's concerns are uh but but making sure that that's an organized voice and a present voice in some of these uh you know when the when the board meets when um uh when we are having these discussions that's awesome. Thank you so much, Anthony. I think so. I'm going to go to a couple of questions from that are coming in. Um, this is sort of just building a little bit on the conversation. So if there's anything additional that you wanted to say, but a question coming in about um, where you are actually seeing the most opposition right now. Is it hospital systems or insurance providers? How are you guys addressing any of that opposition? I'll start. Well, I, oh, yeah, please, Bill. Oh, please go ahead, Matt. If... Well, I, I would just say, you know, there was a lot of pushback in particular, uh, you know, from private equity firms around the market consolidation uh, pieces, right? So I think that's an area that we'll um, have to be really mindful of. Um, and, you know, I, I, so that that's a place where we're particularly worried and, and consolidation has played an outside role, particularly in California, because um, particularly in Northern California, um, just the geographics of our state, we have a few systems that pretty much dominate the market um, and end up driving prices in a way because there's just not enough competition really to try to, you know, have market forces push it down to Anthony's point. point I mean, this is why the state really needs to step in because workers and families were just falling behind and the people of California were falling behind really at the expense of some pretty large players that are doing pretty well. Um, so, you know, I see that uh those as potential issues, but then also the, you know, um, the increased interest from the money sort of uh, private equity folks coming into healthcare space saying, hey, maybe there's an opportunity here, where at the end of the day, we really have to continue to keep this focused on providing high quality, high value care um, for the people of California. Go ahead, Bill, yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with what Matt just said. The, um, it depends on which part of the uh, legislation we we're talking about here. Uh, there is an element of this we haven't talked a lot about, but it was on the slides uh, earlier that um, uh, Alicia presented. Uh, the legislation includes the authority for the Office of Healthcare Affordability to conduct what's called a cost and market impact review. Um, it's an assessment of the potential impact uh, on cost and quality and access and equity of proposed mergers and acquisitions in the healthcare arena. Uh, and those um, emergency regulations are gonna be going into effect January 1st to, um, and they apply to any proposed mergers and acquisitions that would uh, occur after April 1st of 2024. There's been a tremendous amount of <laughs> debate about those. And a lot of the pushback on that came from private equity firms. Um, uh, because they're in the business of acquiring and making money. Um, some of it also came from the big um, insurance or integrated insurance uh, systems like uh, United uh, Healthcare and others that are not just providing uh, health insurance services, but are buying up physician groups and hospital systems. Uh, and they have been growing through uh, acquisition. So they, they address concern about that process. Um, so that's that's where the pressures come on that element of our work. The element though related to the cost growth targets, a lot of that has come from hospitals and physicians, less so from health plans themselves. Uh, at least they've been relatively quiet. And again, it's not all hospitals and health systems. As Anthony said, there are many hospitals, individual system, uh, hospitals and um, 
uh, and, and health system health systems, as well as physician groups that are trying to do the right thing and really want to work with this, with us, with the state uh, to, to be successful. They, they share a goal of improved affordability and they really mean it. Uh, and we really want to work with those partners and we have on the legislation and the implementation. But there are others that um, are, have expressed concerns about the way uh, things are being done and have pushed for adjustments to the targets, have pushed for slower phase in of the targets. Uh, and uh, it's imp important for us to, um, again, articulate what our, our position is to stay unified uh, and to be persistent uh, to make sure that things don't slide off uh, in the wrong direction. Um, again, th these are, they're, they're real issues. I'm not saying they sh should be dismissed out of hand, uh, but there's a point of view from consumers, purchasers, and uh, patients and labor that we need to we're trying to solve an affordability crisis here. Let's keep our eye on the ball uh, and let's try to get this done. Yeah, in other words, let's uh, let's hold let's hold their feet to the fire. Obviously, you've got to find you got to make sure that people can meet the meet the requirements. But um, you know, there's sometimes uh, a strategy to delay forever, and we and you can't have that either. So you got to find the right right balance for you guys. Um, okay, another question coming in. I know we're coming to the top of the hour. Um, uh, this question coming in that says the largest contributions to rising healthcare costs is not from hospitals, but actually from inflation due to market manipulation and monopolies. Isn't this office and strategy just able to throw darts at the flank of large national corporations like insurance companies, PBMs, and hedge funds, which are sucking profit out of medical services? There's a lot in there, but any anyone want to take that one? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I partially agree. Partially, I mean, like some of the, the some of the cost increases are from hospital monopolies. That that, right. that there are that there is definitely again even within California. Um, you know, you saw it with the Sutter settlement. You saw it, you know, with the research that has been done that shows the significant increase in Northern California versus Southern California, in um, partially because of the concentrated um, power of of hospitals, but also other forms like medical groups or other entities. You see it in Monterey County, um, where there clearly is a market failure where costs are significant are significantly higher, and that needs to be looked at. And so, having that um, information is important. Bill talked about the one part of the Office of Healthcare Affordability, which is this cost and market impact review, which is really important for us to even have a sense of what's going on in our healthcare system. You know, frankly, the consolidation and of of the you know just within the physician community in the last decade has been astonishing, and to, and it's really sort of gone under the radar screen. And so to have some um, greater uh, lens on that, and frankly, um, you know the. Uh, on that function, you know, we need to have, you know, more oversight over the mergers and consolidations. Um, you know, some may be appropriate, some may be important, but um, just to even know about them, and frankly, not just to have this kind of uh, data review of, of it at, uh, under the office, but also to have attorney general oversight, um, like the attorney general has over nonprofit hospitals, and that that will be the subject of of legislation. So I, that is uh, um, in the twenty twenty four. So I I want to be clear with um, that the office is uh, a very important tool toward these goals of of cost and quality and equity. But it's but it's in the context of continued other efforts, whether it's the 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 kind of hospital transparency and other efforts going on at the federal level. Uh, with what just passed the House or our continued efforts at the state level um, uh, that we will continue. Oh, that's awesome, you guys. And I know we're coming up, we've got about a minute left. So I'm going to give you a twofer with a lightning round. And as we're wrapping up, uh, what is the one thing uh, that you want either advocates who are on the call or if there's some Hill staffers on who are listening in, what is the one thing, one or two things you want them to take away from this conversation as they might be thinking about uh, national or state policy solutions uh, and learning from you guys. And you probably have like 15 seconds each. Matt's going first. I love it. Sure. I'll go first. So just make sure there's real accountability and build it with the healthcare workforce in mind and patients in mind. Awesome. Bill? Accountability, but it has to be with a, a clear vision, a unified voice, and persistence. Love and, that. Persistence. And and put the consumer at the center that at the end of the day this is a um 
people need relief uh, uh, and, you know, make sure that there's the tools and the accountability to get to, to get the goal that um, to get to the goal of actually more affordable care, uh, you know, with, with the value of quality and equity um, throughout. Awesome, you guys. I just thank you, each of you, so much for joining us. Thank you to all the participants for joining today. The webinar has been recorded, so we'll be sharing it out. If anyone has any follow-up questions, please let us know. And if you haven't seen the Health Affairs article uh, that these guys and others co-authored, I encourage you to, talk, uh, to take a look at it. It's an excellent piece and really gets into some additional the detail. Um, thank you very much for joining, everyone, and uh, happy holidays to everybody.